morning, everyone. Thanks for showing up despite all the drinks and uh, yesterday. Um, so I was giving this general title about predictability. Uh, actually, I will introduce some concepts about predictability of flow regimes in this first lecture. And then the other ones will actually be more on in fact, flow regimes and how they relate to the concept of multiple equilibria, which is the main topic of this school. So, so this is the outline of, of the first lecture. I will give some introduction about some dynamical concepts and some overview of essential literature. Uh, some of you may have already <laughs> maybe seen some of the slides or may be well familiar with this. You know, in this course, it's a bit difficult to find out exactly uh, the target. So we'll go somehow from the very quite general in the first lecture to something more specific and detailed in. Uh, in the last one. Um, I will talk a bit about the detection of, of flow regimes and multiple equilibria in atmospheric and model data sets, so how one can use techniques like uh, probability density function estimation in one or two dimensions, and I will give you one example of cluster analysis, which is now widely used to look for regimes, and specifically one example for the North Atlantic Ocean that I will, this is a topic that I will uh, develop in the other lectures. And then, yeah, then I will talk about the sources of extended range predictability and how one can use this concept somehow to uh, provide an alternative way of providing the output from uh, seasonal and subseasonal forecasts. So, first, just a, a few definitions uh, about some dynamical concepts which are closely, closely related to each other. So we have been talking about multiple equilibria and of a nonlinear system, and, and we have seen examples from you know, the climate simulations of uh, you know, aqua planet and simple uh, com uh, configurations of, um, of the planet. So multiple, when we talk about multiple equilibria, usually we re we think about multiple stationary solutions of a nonlinear dynamical system. And uh, this was somehow the, the original concept when people started to approach uh, this, this problem. And it has been studied in, in, in the ocean, it has been studied in the context of uh, climate variability on, on time scales of gla glacial interglacial periods and it has been studied in the context of variability of planetary waves and blocking. A related concept is the one of flow regime, and flow regime is uh, basically a persistent or recurrent large-scale flow pattern in a geophysical um, fluid dynamic system. So multiple equilibria, usually we think about some stable points, but in reality, uh, you know, the, the atmosphere-ocean system is, is continuously moving, so basically, uh, what you may have are uh, stationary states which are not stable, but they are weakly unstable. And then you can have orbits uh, around these uh, stationary states. And so somehow you can have you know, the, the flow uh, having configurations which are very similar for each other for some period, and then suddenly they switch. Uh, to a different configuration. And for example, you know, in the weather forecasting, we often talk about uh, transition from a zonal regime to a blocking regime or so on. And in fact, when, when you apply this concept of flow regimes to the weather, uh, then when, that's when we, uh, we talk about weather regimes. So weather regimes are simply flow regimes, uh, basically in, in, uh, in the real world. And so basically, the large scale configuration of the flow determines the characteristics of the local weather. So if you think about the most basic concept of, of flow regimes and, and nonlinear system, an example that now has become quite popular, and um, uh, I used personally with, with both John and, and Tim Palmer in, in the 90s, is the analogy with the uh, Lorentz convection model um, published in 1963, that was the first example of a chaotic attractor. And the, uh, this system is just a system of, of three equations with uh, nonlinear terms. Uh, you see here the, um, let's see whether we have a pointer somewhere, it should be here. 
Does it work? No, well, it doesn't. Uh, you see here this uh, minus xz and xy terms. So this, this provides some nonlinearities in, uh, in the system. And basically, this is a, a, a very simplified system of so-called relic Benard convection, which is the convection which occurs between two plates which are kept at different temperatures, with the bottom one being, being warmer than the um, upper one. And so the system gains heat from the bottom and loses heat at the top, and this heat is transported by convective cells. So physically, um, you know, the, this system has a chaotic attractor in a certain range of, of parameters. Um, and this attractor is basically shaped by the existence of uh, three stationary solutions. One of them corresponds to no motion and is strongly unstable, so we never actually see uh, the state in, in the attractor. The other two are only weakly unstable, and basically they are at the center of the two wings of, of the attractor. So somehow the, uh, so the system is time evolving, but it has two sort of preferred regions in phase space where the um, uh, the state vector resides, and these basically are regions around two unstable stationary solutions. So we can think about the two wings of the Lorentz attractor as representing these flow regimes uh, around the, the two unstable equilibrium. Now, if we now move to uh, the atmosphere, then uh, basically this concept was usually applied, again, mainly late 70s and 80s, early 90s, to atmospheric models. And usually people used rather simple atmospheric models, either a simple barotropic vorticity equation or some quasi-geostrophic uh, system with maybe two or three layers. And in this case, uh, you can sort of summarize the dynamics of the system by an equation for either barotropic or quasi-geostrophic potential vorticities, potential vorticities Q. Um, and uh, so the, the time derivative is given by the advection of potential vorticity. And then uh, on the right-hand side, you have this D term, which is basically uh, a, a relaxation towards some equilibrium, which is determined by uh, a forcing term Q star. So when we look for multiple equilibria, we look for stationary states of the equation at the top. So we look for uh, values of, of Q. And from ge quasi geostrophic theory, uh, you probably know that basically from potential vorticity, you can derive the string function. And therefore, once you know the potential vorticity, the, the whole flow is, is determined. So when we look for multiple equilibria, we look basically for uh, stationary solutions of this particular equation at a specific instantaneous time. However, um, yeah, the concept of weather regime is not about what happens in one particular instant, but rather what happens in um, a certain, in a period, uh, which is longer than the typical time scale of uh, uh, weather system. So if a baroclinic wave has a time scale of maybe three days, uh, then you know, a weather regime may have a typical time scale of 10 or 15 days or, or, or longer. So what we can do is actually to average um, this equation in time. And in, in a similar way in which you can do uh, a decomposition between uh, uh, zonal and eddy flow, as, as uh, Simona uh, showed yesterday, uh, you can average the, uh, the top equation in time. And because of this linearity, um, you have just the terms in the equation where you replace the, um, the instantaneous field of potential vorticity with this time mean. And then you have this term, which is basically the effect of the variability of modes which have a higher frequency uh, than the period over which you have averaged. So uh, this could be the effect of the planetary waves, let's say. And this is what uh, was called the uh, eddy forcing term. So basically, it tells you that the, 
the high, the high frequency variability actually gives a feedback onto the large scale flow, and this man, maintains the flow in some sort of statistical equilibrium. Now, there have been a lot of papers written on, on multiple equilibria and flow regimes in the atmosphere. So we'll just uh, remind you of some uh, very well-known papers that somehow were some sort of landmark in, in, in the study. And uh, probably the one about multiple equilibria in uh, atmospheric flow was the one by Charney and Devore, published in 1979. Actually, Axel Wynn Nielsen published in the same year uh, a very similar paper um, that somehow got much uh, less known. And um, so in this model is a simple uh, barotropic model of the flow uh, in a mid-latitude channel. And at the bottom of the channel, there is a topography, which has a sinusoidal shape. And the, the flow is just described by the strength of the zonal mean wind um, and the two phases of a wave, which has the same wavelength as the topography. And the system um, actually has two uh, stable states. One has stronger zonal flow, and the ridges are in phase with the topography. The other one has a weaker zonal flow. Uh, the ridges are positioned on the valleys. Um, and the wave amplitude is, is larger. This paper was very influ uh, influential at the time, and then uh, uh, actually, you know, Charney School uh, developed there were a number of his uh, postdocs who uh, developed more sophisticated model. Uh, for example, uh, David Strauss developed uh, a two-level baroclinic bar version of the system. Uh, Shu Klein more again with Charney investigate again a barotropic model, but with uh, very many de degrees of freedom. But actually, um, the term weather regime was actually introduced by a paper by Reinhold and Pierre Hambert in 1982. Uh, and what they did, they took the uh, two level um, quasi geostrophic model that was developed by Charney and Strauss. This actually had, if I remember correctly, uh, five uh, stationary states. But then they added, uh, that model was only a model for, again, the zonal flow and the planetary waves. They added mm, many more degrees of freedom so they would allow the system to develop baroclinically unstable waves. And what they showed was that, in fact, you know, the, the, the baroclinic waves were destabilizing some of this equilibrium, some cases more strongly, some cases more weakly. And then what the attractor of the system would do, would basically switch between the neighborhood of two of these um, weakly unstable states. And they, um, they refer these two as the ridge regime and the trough regime, again, uh, because in these two regimes, the waves had a different phase with respect to the topography. So in one case, there was a ridge over the topography. In another case, there was a trough over the topography. They were rather um, un unstable states, but somehow the system uh, was not spending a lot of time with this. So somehow, uh, this was the paper that actually uh, bridged somehow the, you know, uh, the gap between the, uh, the multiple equilibria studies that just describe the equilibria and the more sort of common uh, knowledge of mid-latitude weather, which is dominated by baroclinic disturbances. However, you know, the, the concept that the eddies were actually uh, interacting with uh, the large scale flow and they uh, could uh, maintain the large scale flow in a stationary state was not actually new. And it was, was actually uh, uh, probably this made popular by the work of John Green and, and this school. And John was uh, uh, working with, uh, with John Green at Imperial College at, at the time. Um, so the, basically, the Imperial College School focused on the impact of uh, uh, high frequency eddies with blocking highs. And you probably know uh, what a blocking is, is basically uh, a ridge an area of high pressure which is located at high latitudes and it's called blocking because it basically blocks the, uh, the flow of uh, baroclinic transients uh, along the storm track and the storm track is usually divided into branches 
one goes to the north and one goes to, uh, to the south. So although blocking is more frequent during um, the winter season, there are summer blocks. At the moment, there is a summer block <laughs> over the UK, and they are actually having much higher temperatures than, than we have here. Uh, so uh, Green actually focused on, on uh, what happened during July uh, 1976. There was a strong block that caused the drought over the UK. And Green showed that this actually block was maintained by the flow of potential vorticity uh, brought by high frequency transits. So th this uh, concept was developed in, uh, in a number of subsequent papers. These are just um, a few ones. And the ones that uh, John did in 87 with Kit Heinz uh, actually show how a modern structure, which again is a stationary solution of the flow, ca can be seen as a prototype of a blocking dipole. And again, it can be maintained against dissipation by uh, the eddy vorticity flow by baroclinic transients. Another paper that developed this concept uh, was the one by uh, Votar and, and Legrand. Uh, they again looked uh, at a two-level quasi-geostrophic model uh, in a channel with many degrees of freedom, and they found regimes. But the difference between this paper and the previous ones is that in the other papers, uh, the regimes were formed around multiple equilibria. So you, you had a system. The system had uh, multiple stationary states for the instantaneous flow. Some of them were strongly unstable, so the system went easily away from those states. Others were only weakly unstable, and the, you know, the attractor was somehow shaped by this. The difference of uh, the paper by Votar and Legrave was that in their model, there were no multiple equilibria of the instantaneous flow. So the, what they did, they actually forced a jet through a thermal forcing uh, in, say, the, the, the left hand side of the channel. And what they showed is that because of the eddy feedback, they could actually have flows that were more zonal, like this one, or flow where the jet was actually split and there was some hint of a dipole in the middle, and they called it a blocking state. So what they were arguing was that somehow you could have weather regimes even without having uh, multiple equilibria, whether this is the case or not, uh, is, still, um, is still debatable. The other um, thing that somehow, yeah. So that could be a multiple equilibrium, is it? Uh, two states. Uh, one is zonal uh, flow, one is blocking time. So why, why don't you say that? Well, in, in, in the sense that these are, it's, I think it's better to call these flow regimes. So if you take the time average flow, uh, then you have these states which are relatively persistent. But if you analytically solve the equation and look for stationary states, uh, well, I, I didn't know it, but what I did, and they claim that there was only one st stationary state for the instantaneous flow. So the, the, the alternation of regimes only came because of the fact that the bioclinic transients could actually support different configurations of, of, of the flow. So in, in this case, there was yeah, no need for the large scale forcing to actually allow for multiple equilibria of, of, of the system. Do you, do you remember, did they only look for stationary uh, points, or did they also look for higher dimensional uh, sort of invariant manifolds like orbits, whatever they could. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember, honestly. Um, I, I don't think they, they made an analysis like, like that, if I remember correctly. They, on, they only talked about the fact that there was only one equilibrium. But well, definitely the equilibrium must have been unstable. Otherwise, they couldn't have had multiple regimes. So, okay. Uh, so the other, yeah, the other thing I want to say about this uh, this paper is that it actually uh, refocused the attention from the hemispheric flow and you know the large scale planetary waves to what happens in one particular sector. So basically, what they were saying is that their model was an analog for 
the regimes in, in the North Atlantic. They were mainly talking about, you know, um, analogo for, for uh, Atlantic blocking. Okay, you could apply this as well to the North Pacific. But somehow, yeah, if this uh, idea is true, it means that you can actually have regimes independently uh, downstream of a jet. Uh, so you, you don't need somehow planetary wave dynamics to have regimes, and, and you can study the, uh, the regimes independently, perhaps in the North Atlantic and the North Pacific. Now, OK, you have these nice theories of planetary waves. Then you have to, uh, to find a way of uh, detecting them uh, in, in observational data or, or in model data. And um, one of the first attempt was uh, was done by Alfonso Sutera. It just happened that during my first year at TCMWF, I was a visitor, and he was a visitor as well. He was actually, uh, his permanent position was at Yale with Barry Salzman, and he was doing some of the, in fact, the multiple equilibria and uh, stochastic resonance studies uh, that David uh, Ferreira talk, uh, talked about in his, um, in his talk. Uh, so he was very much in this idea of multiple equilibria, and, and he was now interested in finding some observational evidence for these theories of uh, multiple equilibria in the planetary waves. And uh, while he was at the CMWF, he, he basically found that in the CMWF analysis for the winters that he had available, at the time there were only four years in the CMWF uh, analysis, he could find bimodality if he combined the amplitude of zonal wave numbers 2, 3, and 4 uh, from geopotential height data. Uh, of course, four years were not a lot, uh, so it was hard to prove the statistical significance in such a short record. So when he went back to Yale, he worked with Tony Hansen, and they looked at the record uh, of geopotential height in the uh, NCEP, uh, well, at the time it was the NMC, uh, reanalysis and they had 16 years and they so they published this paper when they showed that the probability uh, density function for this planetary wave index had two modes uh, one corresponding to weaker planetary wave amplitude and one corresponding to larger planetary wave amplitude and if you take the a composite of all the fields in this mode and then all the fields in this other mode, and you take the difference. Uh, what you see on the right hand side is, is the plot of the geopotential height difference. So the, the high state had actually ridges uh, over the North Pacific and the North Atlantic, roughly in the position where they are blocking it. So somehow this related to the general concept at the time that whether that multiple equilibria were a possible explanation for, for blocking. However, this work was much criticized, uh, mainly because you know, people found out that uh, the results were very sensitive to the exact band in which they were uh, computing uh, this, um, this Fourier decomposition of uh, the planetary waves. Uh, it depended also on, on the method that they used to compute. Uh, the probability density function. Um, and yeah, with 16 years, it was not, even with 16 years, it was not easy to demonstrate the statistical significance for that. I think recent studies that have been published more recently that have revisited this have actually shown that the index is indeed bimodal in, um, in a longer record. However, this was the first attempt, and this somehow used the simplest method to try to uh, detect multiple regimes or to condense everything into one single index. And if there are multiple regimes, the idea is that uh, the probability density function of this index should have peaks in correspondence to these different regimes and the minimum in between. However, yeah, when you condense everything in one uh, single number, of course, you have to <laughs> need to make a lot of assumptions. You, you, discard a lot of, of degrees of freedom. Um, and so uh, soon after that, people started to think about, well, can we have something, can we look for, for regimes uh, in a way where we can actually see more structure in the, um, in the patterns related to these regimes? So the simple extension, you can go from one to two degrees of freedom. 
and what people have done, for example, already um, Kimoto and Gil, for example, they did two papers with this technique. Um, Susanna Corti, Tim Palmer, and myself did one in 1999. Uh, you can do a principal component analysis of the geopotential height field. You only retain uh, the dominant principal components. The simplest thing is that you retain the first two. And then you can compute, uh, again, with suitable statistical techniques, a probability density function um, in a plane instead of just in one dimension. So you have now two dimensions. And when we did that with, uh, with Suzanne and Tim, uh, we, we found a probability density function that had three peaks. Um, and if we actually composited the, the anomaly, the geopotential height anomalies uh, around these three regions, uh, these were the uh, anomalies in geopotential height that we found. So this was done using monthly means from, again, uh, the NSEP reanalysis. Uh, this time we had about 50 years. Um, but again, because we used monthly means, uh, again, you know, the size of our sample was not too large, and again, we were criticized that the statistical significance was uh, not maybe as large as people would have liked. But anyway, it was, uh, it was an attempt somehow to, uh, to put a bit more structure into the patterns of, of these regimes and not allow just a variation along one simple index. And somehow what, um, the reason why perhaps this two-dimensional picture was easier to, to digest is that you could see here structures uh, similar to the linear teleconnection patterns that have been studied uh, by many people, Bolos and Gassler and many others, like you, know, you have here uh, the North Atlantic oscillation, uh, here in this positive phase, uh, in the other regime on this negative phase, uh, and then you have something like the Pacific North American pattern. So somehow uh, you could see these uh, hemispheric scale regimes uh, as particularly stable combinations of these uh, teleconnection patterns, and this was somehow more uh, uh, easy to uh, <laughs> to sell to the meteorological community than just the simple one-dimensional index of um, Hansen and, and, and Sutera. But of course, you can go to even more dimensions. And um, well, if you do that, it's hard at this point to just compute the probability density function, uh, even if you use uh, data with higher frequency, the daily data, uh, you don't, even in, in the longer cycle, you don't have in there, have enough points to really estimate the PDF in many dimensions with the techniques like uh, the Kermel technique that is often used in one or two dimensions. So people resort to techniques called cluster analysis. Cluster analysis is a multivariate statistical techniques. And basically what it does is that you represent your data through um, a set of, of coordinates, can be any number. Again, <coughs> Often people do a, a principal component analysis and use the principal components as coordinates. And then basically the cluster analysis would look at the distance uh, between these points and will form groups, clusters, of points that are close to each other. And so basically we'll partition your whole record of data into separate groups. Now the um, the objection that can be done to cluster analysis is that it will always find groups. It's designed to find groups. And so you cannot say that, oh, you know, because just because you find clusters, then this means that there are uh, dynamical regimes. In fact, if you think about uh, a multivariate system where the probability density distribution is just a multivariate Gaussian distribution, so you only have one maximum. If you apply the cluster analysis, it, it will give you clusters. So uh, what you have to do when you do cluster analysis is to do, again, a test of statistical significance. And this is often done in this way. So you, you take a reference data set that you know has only one maximum in the, in the PDF. Usually you take a, yeah, a multivariate normal distribution. You apply the cluster analysis, and somehow you, ca you can quantify uh, how well the data are actually clustered uh, by 
basically measuring the ratio of the variance. So you can look at the variance, which is explained by the mean of these clusters. And then you can look at the variance of the deviations from the means. And if, if this ratio is large, so if the centroids explain a large proportion of variance, then somehow it means that the clusters are more robust and, and vice versa. So you can have this number, this ratio, this sort of signal to noise ratio. You can compute it from the real data. And then you can repeat the calculation many times on data that you construct, but from, for example, a multinormal distribution. So that will give you a range of values for this ratio that may just happen by chance. So this is what basically the cluster analysis would do, uh, even if there were actually no regimes. Uh, so you can look at the distribution of these random values, and you may say that your real, the clusters from the real world are significant only if this ratio is larger than, say, 95% of the values which are obtained by chance. So uh, Michelangeli, Votar, and Legrappa uh, did uh, such an analysis in 1995. Uh, it was applied to uh, the North Atlantic sector. And when they used this uh, you know, cluster analysis technique, which is usually called k-means, uh, it, it, it's a rather simple analysis that basically looks for uh, assigns each point to the closest centroids, and it does it iteratively um, until it finds an optimal partition of variance. Um, and then they computed the significance for different number of clusters. And they came out with four clusters that were actually already found by Robert Votar in, in, in an earlier study. Um, and this, uh, basically, these uh, Atlantic clusters um, are not totally uh, symmetric. So you have two clusters that actually correspond to opposite phases of uh, the North Atlantic oscillation, uh, which I think are the ones that at the top. You either have a high or uh, a low over Greenland. And in one case, you have enhanced zonal flow. And, and in the other case, you have a weakened zonal flow shifted to the south on the North Atlantic. And then you have two states, which are the ones at the bottom, uh, with enhanced ridges. Uh, so you may have either a ridge here over the North Sea of Scandinavia, and this often gives rise to a blocking. Uh, or you can have a ridge here in the middle of the Atlantic. And so this regime is usually called the Atlantic Ridge, and this is called the blocking. So this paper, again, was uh, <coughs> quite successful, and, and many people then uh, adopted this four regime classification uh, for uh, the North Atlantic as a basis of, of uh, subsequent research. OK, so let's make an assumption that you can, that you believe that there are uh, flow regimes, and somehow you have found a suitable method to detect them. Now, if you work in a, a weather forecasting center, as I do at the moment, um, you would like to use this concept to make predictions. Now, you don't need a weather regimes to predict the weather up to three days, because the weather up to three days will be determined by baroclinic weather systems. But if you are going into the medium range, say the second week of your forecast, or if you are doing subseasonal forecast or seasonal forecast, then you it's very hard, and after, let's say, 10, 50 days, it's basically impossible to tell what happens at one uh, specific time. So what you want to do is to give probabilities for certain flow configurations. And so flow regimes become quite handy. So um, what, what you hope is that there is some predictability uh, in the frequency of occurrence of this regime. So you can say, well, you know, in the next month, let's say, this particular regime will become more frequent, so more likely uh, this other regime will become less likely. Now, we have seen that regimes exist in uh, nonlinear chaotic system. So at first sight, you will say, well, there's not a lot of <laughs> hope for that. You know, the system is chaotic. You will have transitions which are driven by baroclinic eddies. We know that baroclinic eddies, we can only forecast them for a few days. So what can you do? 
The answer is that actually uh, the atmosphere doesn't have always exactly the same forcing, or at least if we concentrate on one region, let's think about the North Atlantic region. Uh, so, you know, the flow is forced by, for example, in you know, topography, the flow is forced by uh, lengthy contrast, and these are always there. But some of the forcing actually comes from sources, for example, of, of Rossby waves that are located in the tropics, and this vary because the location of tropical convection varies. So basically, the hope of finding predictability in, in flow regimes uh, mainly comes from the concept that the forcing from the slow part of the climate system, so it could be the tropical ocean, but people are now studying the impact, for example, of sea ice variation or snow cover over Eurasia. So this, this sort of slow component of the climate system modify the forcing for the large scale flow in a region, and therefore they can modify the properties of uh, these flow regimes. Um, and coming back to the analogy with the Lorentz system, uh, you can simulate that by adding one additional term, for example, this Y star on the right hand side of the second equation. And since in, in, in the Lorentz system, uh, the, uh, the Y variable is basically a measure of the horizontal variation of temperature, having a forcing for Y, it means that instead of having uh, a constant, a uniform heat flux at the bottom, uh, you may actually have uh, stronger heat fluxes in some point and weaker heat fluxes in other points. So what this will do is that it will break the symmetry of the system. You know, in the, in the Lorentz system, the two regimes are simply determined by a change in the rotation of the convective cells. So energetically, they are, they are equivalent. So if you start putting a bit more heat in certain um, points of the bottom plate, then the, the flow will preferably have ascent over the points where you have uh, more heat. Um, so somehow, this would be a sort of physical analogy for this, um, uh, this Y term. So if you do that, uh, <coughs> sorry, what's happening here? Now, so when you modify the forcing parameters in a nonlinear system, you, you basically have two scenarios. One is that the one that is usually illustrated by the analogy with the Lorentz model. And that is when the, the variation in the forcing is relatively small compared to the overall forcing of, of the system. And in that case, so if the regimes are quite well defined, um, Putting a weak anomaly in the forcing does not change the number and therefore the spatial and, and the spatial patterns of regimes. They remain roughly the same, but the frequency, the frequency of occurrence is changed. And in the Lorentz system, this happens because um, it makes one of the two st stationary solutions less unstable and one is made more unstable. So then the system stays preferentially around the stationary solution, which is more stable. So when the forcing parameter is weak, you only modify the stability of the equilibrium. And therefore, you modify the frequency of occurrence. But if the, um, the forcing anomaly is strong, then, as it has been mentioned earlier in the week, you can go to bifurcation points. So bifurcation points it means that you can go from a situation where you only have, for example, ones steady states to two steady states, then the steady states may become, they can change from stable to unstable, and so the shape of the attractor changes substantially. So um, there are situations where the weak forcing anomaly is, is appropriate, but there are also uh, situations where it is not, and you may have more dramatic changes as we have seen, for example, in, in, in the aquaplanet simulation uh, and the interaction with the, um, with the ice. So what are the real sources of this forcing variation in the real world? Um, 
as I mentioned, the first thing that comes to the mind is, is, is the variation in heating in the tropics, and of course, one of these <coughs> the main sources of um, variability for the, uh, the, the thermal for the forcing of planetary waves is the variability associated with uh, uh, with the Nino and the Southern Oscillation. Uh, um, I assume you are more or less familiar, otherwise I could spend the rest of the morning describing these particular slides, uh, which I think is one of the most frequently seen slides uh, in uh, <laughs> presentations about uh, long-range predictability. But the important thing to uh, notice is that the effect of the El Nino phenomenon is basically to change the position of the main convective heating in, uh, in the tropical Pacific. So, uh, the position of the heat source is changed, the Rossby wave source is changed, and so the Rossby waves that propagate into the middle altitudes are changed. And so this basically translates into a different forcing for uh, the northern hemisphere planetary waves, at least at least in the in the Pacific. And then we know from linear, we, in this case we don't need non-linear non studies, from a lot of uh, observational and, and linear modeling studies. Uh, if you modify the heat sources in the tropics, then you'll generate uh, teleconnections to Rossby waves that prop will propagate uh, into, um, into the mid-latitudes. And a very famous paper in this was the one by Horel and Wallace published in 1981, when they, they related variability in the, <coughs> in the tropical Pacific with the variability of the Pacific North American pattern. So you can exploit this, and uh, for example, we, so we did something like that with, uh, with David Strauss uh, and again Susanna Corti in 2007. Um, we used uh, a large ensemble of simulation forced by observed SSTs that were run at the Center for Ocean Land Atmosphere Studies, where David is, is working. So this was um, a set of uh, ensemble with 55 members, so pretty large ensembles, for uh, about 20 years. Um, so we did, uh, we did a cluster analysis of geopotential height uh, over a sector covering um, the, the North Pacific, uh, North America, and, and the Western Atlantic. Uh, we used the, uh, the same technique that we used in Michelangeli et al., this K-means uh, clustering structure. We came out with four, uh, um, uh, with four clusters or four regimes. Uh, um, basically, the, the top two were called Alaskan region, Pacific trough, because basically you have either a region or a trough over uh, the Aleutian Islands or, or Alaska. And then the bottom two were more sort of zonally symmetric, and so we call them <coughs> Arctic low and Arctic high. And this somehow connect some uh, variability at higher latitudes in a more sort of symmetric pattern. In this case, SST was prescribed? SST was prescribed, and, and I think okay, 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 SST. observed SST uh, for these 18, um, 18 winters. <coughs> so we did this for the model, and we did this for the analysis, and there was a reasonably good correspondence between the clusters in the analysis and the clusters of regimes. So we could look at the frequency of these four clusters in the analysis and uh, in these ensembles. And we, we did plot like this, where the uh, blue curve is the frequency of each cluster in the uh, NCEP uh, analysis. Um, the green band gives the spread <coughs> of, um, of the frequency between the 55 uh, ensemble members, so we compute the frequency for each season. And the red curve is the ensemble mean. So if you put all the, if you, what you get if you compute the frequency putting all the 55 members together. And, um, well, you can see that not all the regimes are equally predictable. Uh, certainly it turned out that uh, this Pacific draft was the most uh, predictable one. You, you can see that there's quite a good correspondence between the peaks in the red curve and the blue curve. 
And if you actually look at the years that you cannot probably see, this actually corresponds to the El Nino year. And this is why, uh, this is because this pa particular cluster uh, projects strongly onto the mean response by ENSO. Uh, if you look at other uh, clusters, like for example this Arctic High, you hardly see any, uh, any predictability. So it's not that every cluster is equally predictable, every regime is equally predictable. Um, and in, in the Pacific somehow, uh, the fact that the Pacific is so much influenced by ENSO, somehow makes it easy to predict those, uh, those regimes which have patterns uh, which somehow are more strongly related with the answer response. So this is an example when you use basically the weak forcing paradigm. And so you, you just assume that the clusters are the same and what you change from one season to the other is only the frequency. And then you can basically you try to predict the frequency. But actually since for each of these years we actually had 55 members, there were actually enough data to do a cluster, also a cluster analysis in each individual year. And so I, I mentioned before that you can actually measure the strength of this cluster by the signal to noise ratio, which is the very ratio of variance explained by the centroids divided by the variance, the internal variance of the clusters. So we did this analysis with David um, in, in 2004, actually before <laughs> the other paper. And what you see here is this variance ratio for clusters in the, in the Pacific. The domain was slightly different, so uh, in the end we found that the three cluster partition was the most robust. But we plotted this signal to noise ratio as a function of the Nino 3 SST index. And, and what you can see is the very strong relationship. So basically, it turns out that the clusters explain a lot of variance. Uh, where you are um, in a La Nina state, but gradually when uh, uh, the Nino forcing increases, then you end up, uh, and these two points were 1982, 83, and 1996, uh, 97, so, sorry, 97, 98, so the two biggest El Nino before the most recent one in uh, 2015, 16. And actually, when you come to such a strong forcing, it actually turns out then uh, these ratios are not statistically significant. So basically, when there is a strong El Nino, the forcing is so strong that it basically uh, forces the system just to stay in one single equilibrium with just linear oscillation around this. So, <clears throat> so you can see this in, uh, perhaps as an analog, an analog of, of, of a bifurcation. So basically, when, when the forcing, the El Nino forcing is, is, uh, is very strong, uh, then you only have one equilibrium. And gradually, when you move towards uh, a La Nina state, then you start having uh, multiple regimes. And perhaps a simple explanation of this is that usually these regimes are associated with uh, zonal asymmetries in, in the forcing. And so during an El Nino state, especially in the very strong uh, the temperature in, in the, uh, across the tropical Pacific becomes more uniform. And so the, the convection is more, uh, is distributed in a more uniform way uh, between the West and the Central Pacific. When you have a La Nina state, instead the convection is strongly concentrated in the West, and therefore the asymmetry, the zonal asymmetry in the forcing is, is, is stronger. So, on the one hand, you say, oh, you know, so it's nice to study things in the, in, in the Pacific because uh, there is, you know, these clear examples of the forcing. On the other hand, this tells you that the influence of El Nino on the structure of the Pacific regimes is, is actually very strong. And so it may explain why uh, people who have done, for example, cluster analysis um, over the Pacific region uh, often <laughs> find results which are a bit different depending on the particular sample they take, uh, the particular technique, or, or the domain. While people who have done the uh, analysis on the Atlantic, they, they seem to agree about these four main clusters that, that I have 
shown before. So perhaps the Atlantic is uh, um, unfortunately less predictable for people <laughs> who are in Europe and who would like to, uh, to know something about these regimes' frequency. Uh, but it might be, they might give an easier job to the theoretician to explain them, because you, you don't have this continuous, very strong variation in, in the forcing uh, that occurs in the Pacific because, uh, because of the El Nino phenomenon. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a you know, double-edged sword. Yeah. So uh, La Nina uh, means <coughs> has uh, more noise. Uh, mean, uh, uh, signal to noise ratio is uh, noise is larger than. So signal is larger. Signal is larger. So the overall variability is larger in 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 El Nino years, but most of the this variability actually comes from yeah the separation between these different regimes. Um, so the, the predictability, in, a, in terms of predictability, probably La Nina may be less predictable. Yeah, La Nina will be less predictable on, on the seasonal time scale. Yeah, because the fluctuation between these regimes, of course, yeah. generates some but often unpredictable uh, signal on, on the seasonal mean. Yes. But my experience tells that uh, well, this, the, this tells you that there are more regimes here. Whether these regimes are more or less predictable, it may depend on whether you can say something about the relative frequency of, of, of regimes. Now, this is, this is not an index of the predictability of the index it, itself. So the Nino tree may be equally predictable in, in positive values and negative values. But if you now want to make a prediction of what will happen in the extratropics as a result of El Nino, um, it may be easier to forecast what happens in an El Nino state because the system is strongly forced towards one single regime. While when you are in El Nino, the system may, for example, may often develop blocking. Uh, over over the North Pacific, the usually are not developed as frequently. What is your experience with the effect of the forecast? So, Rainia is less predictable. What is your experience? Well, the the extratropical flow, yeah, I would. I, I think well, the studies that were done by, for example, by Tim Palmer, Stefano Tibaldi in, in the 80s, they found that. Yeah, during the, the, the La Nina years that often had negative PNA states, the flow was less predictable. At the time, for example, Tim Palmer interpreted this in terms of barotropic instability. But you can also interpret that in, in the sense that a La Nina state would give you different regimes. And so you may have switched between you know, very different regimes during <coughs> the season in, in a La Nina year. And so this may give you less. Uh, less predictability. <coughs> OK, so we are coming uh, to the end. But uh, before that, I, I want to mention that recently the emphasis, so, so on, 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 uh, say on the seasonal time scale, perhaps yeah, the, you know, the Pacific is an easier problem to deal with, uh, at least in certain situations, because of the El Nino forcing. And it seems that. On the seasonal time scale, you cannot say too much about the uh, Atlantic. But recently, it was actually pointed out that if you move to the subseasonal time scale, then you may have predictability for the North Atlantic regimes. And again, this comes from tropical forcing. But in this case, not the seasonal mean forcing associated with SST variation, but just the uh, variation in the position of convection associated with the Madden and Julian oscillation. The Madden and Julian oscillation is a more <coughs> of intraseasonal variability of the tropical atmosphere. You usually start with convection developing in the Western Indian Ocean, then propagating uh, towards the east. Uh, and as long as you move this main area of, of uh, convection on the maritime continent, then the West Pacific, and then usually the convection dies uh, when it moves over the, the colder water in the east, uh, then again, the Rossby wave source is changed. And then you propagate the signal in the uh, extratropics. Now, 
um, usually the phases of the MJO are now quantified through this diagram, um, which is, um, was d designed by Wheeler and Handon in 2004. Now it has become very popular. They did a combined principal component analysis of zonal wind and OLR. And basically, <coughs> if you use the first two uh, principal component, uh, you, you define uh, a plane. You can divide it in eight sectors that correspond to the different regions where convection is located. <laughs> So for example, phases two and three correspond to the phases where convection is over the Indian Ocean. Uh, six and seven is where convection is in, um, over the Western Pacific. So the system moves uh, in an anti-clockwise sense. Uh, if, uh, if the point is within the circle close to the origin, we say that basically there's no active MJO. And this corresponds to basically one standard deviation of these principal uh, components. So this is now a tool which is very widely used, especially, uh, of course, you know, there's a big uh, uh, sub-seasonal uh, program uh, going on, sponsored by WCRP and WWRP. Uh, and so these particular tools are now used in many forecasting centers, and you can see predictions of the Madden and Julian oscillation, where basically the predictions are displayed uh, using this Wheeler and Handel diagram. Now, Kasu in 2008 showed that um, if you actually do a cluster analysis over the Atlantic, and again, you find the same for clusters, so that's nice. And you look at the frequency of these clusters as a function of basically the phase of the MJO basically from the same time to 15 days before. You see a relationship, and you basically see that uh, uh, in particular, positive uh, NAO uh, states, uh, which are mm, these ones here, tend to occur about 10 days after the phases where the convection is over the Indian Ocean, and vice versa, uh, the negative NAO phase tend to occur 10 to 15 days after the MJO phases where uh, you have convection over the West Pacific. So this, again, has become a very popular and, and influential paper. And uh, so again, number of centers, including ECMWF, are now sort of exploiting uh, these connections. And uh, we are, for example, displaying frequency of these four clusters uh, together with the MJO uh, statistics. And uh, it, it works. Sometimes you, you can really see that if there's a big MJO, you can expect uh, a phase of, of the NAO, and, and it really happens. Um, so it's not just a, a statistical um, construct. So uh, I will, in the rest of, of, you know, in the other talks, I will actually mainly focus on, on, on the North Atlantic. Uh, from a theoretical point of view, uh, as I said, it's somehow perhaps an easier problem to deal with. Um, and uh, so we can maybe have five minute breaks, break. And if you have any questions here, <coughs> friends. <laughs> so why is it that on a seasonal time scale, and so is in the Pacific, strong forcing, there's so little signal in Europe, whereas on intra-seasonal time scale, the same situation, forcing is in the Indo-Pacific region, yeah. maybe slightly different, but basically forcing is in the same <coughs> region, but there's a strong signal in Europe. Yeah, I, I, I think it's just a problem of, 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 of persistence. Um, My idea at the moment, I will develop in, in, in the next lecture, is that, in fact, what happens is that you don't have a direct forcing by the SST in the same way that you have for El Nino, so really, really stationary forcing. What you have is that the SST probably change the phases of the MJO, make perhaps, you know, if you have warm SST over the Indian Ocean, then the Phase two and phase three may be stronger with stronger convection and so on. But the convection moves. So in fact, David Strauss has shown that if, you, if this movement is lower, then the teleconnections are stronger. And you, you can actually imagine it, that you know, if you have just a forcing that stays in with the same sign for a very short time and then it switches to the opposite sign, then it will be hard to make a very persistent to get a very persistent response. Um, 
So I, I think the fact that probably a seasonal mean is not the best period to look for in, in the North Atlantic. The typical time scale is perhaps the one more you know, associated with, with, with the MJO. So you can think about a time scale of one MJO cycle, uh, which is about two months, uh, and say, well, in this particular cycle, maybe one phase will be stronger, one phase will be weaker, so you will have a sort of net <coughs> forcing in one particular direction. In fact, if you look at the, uh, if you do, for example, an autocorrelation function for an N MJO index, it roughly stays, may stay in on the same sign for maybe one month, a bit more than one month. But there are only very few winters, for example, when it stays of the same sign throughout the winter. In fact, the, 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 the strong anomaly that we had in the NAO in 2009, 2010 was not because every individual day was particularly strong. But it just happened that there were so many days of negative NAO, then the seasonal mean turned out to be four standard deviation negative. But not because the individual events were strong, it, it, because it was a, one of these very rare cases where the system was actually persistent for a whole season. Usually, yeah, if you look at shorter periods, then, uh, uh, then you, you can see something better over you. Um, so even, uh, even without it, so can't you get um, more predictability in the tropics because uh, the atmosphere tends to be driven more by the ocean. Yeah. So like with the Shukla's work with um, uh, how you can have long range predictability yeah. just with SST, uh, with SST data. Yeah, basically you, you I think in the, yeah in in the Pacific you you see that and you know we were discussing with with Brian this morning when having come. Um, you can still interpret this in a linear framework. Now you you say you modify the SST, you modify the heat source, you have a Rossby wave that will you uh, know I think in the case of El Nino it works perfectly well. Somehow you you, you don't really see you don't really need. Mm, Regimes, perhaps, to to explain the the forcing by um, by Enso. Although, when you are in a La Nina case, then yeah, the fact that you have much more variability, you you, you perhaps you you may need a concept of of change changes between different regimes. Um, yeah, for 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 the Atlantic, I think SSD is is one factor, but. Uh, yeah, there's the substantial intra-seasonal variability in this, in this MJO. So the source may still be an anomaly in, in tropical heating, but it may not be necessarily associated with a strong SST anomaly. It may happen simply because one particular MJO episode may happen to be particularly strong. This is still a question of debate. So how much the MJO is constrained by, by SST. Is, is, is. OK. A few minutes of freedom. No. Yes, I think